This podcast is brought to you by SciFi, the world leader in psychology fitness training. SciFi is scientifically proven to help you optimize your physical, mental, and emotional performance through functional training of your brain, body, and breath. For the first time, have your own clinical psychologist, personal trainer, life coach, breathwork teacher, and mediation instructor all in one. Instead of having to wait months or even years for results, you get them in 75 minutes or less. That's the sci-fi difference. Rewire your brain, retrain your body, and refocus your breath. Learn more at psyfi.nyc. It's been said, you, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit to keep moving forward. That's what Life's Tough, Boxers Are Tougher is all about. I'm your host, Matthew Pomara, and we explore a mountainous challenge that someone in the boxing industry has had to face. Here's your main event in our guest corner. She comes to us with an impressive record of 29 victories with 13 big wins by knockout against only two defeats. From Florida, by way of the Bronx, New York, welcome to the show, The two-time world champion, Maureen, the real million-dollar baby, Shay. Thank you. What what an awesome intro. I think that might have been the best intro I've ever gotten. It's so eloquently said. Thank you. (laughs) My pleasure. I'm glad to have you. What up, Mo? How are you? What's going on? Things are good. Just, you know, busy Friday. The week flies by. I'm just like, oh, man. But I was looking forward to this. So it's good good to hang out Friday night with you. Yeah, always a pleasure. I'm glad mm-hmm. glad to see you. And uh, I don't want to I don't want to put you in a bad mood, but I'm going to ask you a favorite question. Uh-huh. Uh, are you retired? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, a big no. <laughs> it was so funny because that article that you wrote, people were like sending me messages. I'm like, read the article. Don't ask me. I'm not answering. <laughs> so lazy. Everybody just wants the uh, you know the quick responses. I'm like, I don't know. Why don't you find out? And read the article. <laughs> So you you excited to get back into the sport? You love the sport? Oh yeah. You know, it's so funny because I, like I, I, you know, um, I was saying earlier that I I sparred today and um, you know, I haven't, I haven't been sparring. It's been a lot, a while, but you know what? My body needed the break. And I think this is, I'm really happy with where I'm at right now. Like I know with the experience that I have and everything, I know exactly what I'm doing. I feel like I have a great, I mean, I've always had great teams around me, um, but I have a great team around me. Everybody's on the same page. Everybody's checking in with each other. Um, you know, I, my, you know, obviously Derek, my boxing coach was watching my sparring today. And then I sent it to Phil, my strength coach, he watched it immediately. And then my manager, Luigi watched it. And they were all like, man, like, yeah, like it's, I'm, you're good. I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I feel good, but, um, the recovery, you know, the recovery is a big part of it. I think it's more so now that I'm older, but I think like, as long as you listen to your body and I'm super in tune with my body. And I feel like being a female, I get that, you know, that's like a little bit of upper hand that we have because we've always kind of had to be a little bit more than the guys. Um, so I feel, I feel great about it. I feel, I know my recovery, my nutrition's on point, you know, so everything, everything feels good. I mean, there's every day, it's, it's, there's struggles. Every day is a little bit of a struggle because I have a full-time job as well that I, that I love in a gym with my strength coach, you know, so, you know, but I'm really submerged I'm really submerged in my world, which is boxing, strength and conditioning, like every, and I'm around all motivated people. So I couldn't ask for, you know, a better life. Where are you down in Florida? I'm in South Florida. So I live in Boynton beach, but I work and train in Boca Raton. Oh, wow. All right, cool. Oh, so Mo, the show is, uh, you know, called life's tough boxers are tougher, right? So everybody who's in this sport has had to deal with something along the way. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, again, life's tough. Boxers are tougher. Tell us why you're tougher than life. Tough, tougher than life. I feel like because I face life head on and I feel like it, growing up, I've had no choice. And by the way that I was raised, I was raised by a tough Irish father. Um, you know, a man who I didn't show up on curfew when I was 15 years old, I was locked out of the house. You know, a man who, if I slammed my door, he took it off the hinges. Uh, you know, he had no problem throwing anything he could grab at me if I was fresh, you know, uh, soap in the mouth. I got, I got whooped, you know, all of it. So I think that really made me tough. And, and like, I, you know, I've said this a lot before, my father raised me like a human and, um, and my mom too, but mostly my dad, he was the disciplinarian and he really raised me to just listen for every action. There's a consequence, you know, you want to do this. Okay. Well, you're going to pay the consequences. And I wasn't shielded from much. I really had to face a lot, uh, growing up. 
and ending in situations, you know, abusive situations, dealing with mental illness, um, you know, all the way up until even now, just challenges of life. But I've learned to welcome the challenges, even in the ring, fighting with, uh, you know, with, with the injuries, um, blown eardrums, you know, fighting in Tijuana, Mexico, where people were smoking cigarettes right in front of your face in the, while you're trying to throw a double left hook to the body. And I stopped because I couldn't breathe for a minute, you know, um, having to drive myself to my weigh-in in Mexico, six hours, you know, um, fighting at 11 o'clock at night on an empty stomach in a ring that is, you know, I mean, these are my boxing. This isn't life. This is boxing stuff, you know, but life prepared me for that. And, you know, I think if you want something bad enough, I think that's really, you find a way, you know, and, and that's something that I have to credit also, not only my parents, but also my manager also, you know, really enforced that in my life. He's like, well, you know, you don't just, you, you got to like bash down a door, you know, and that's kind of what I've done in my career with, with the support of a lot of good people you know, including yourself, you know, help me with that article and, and writing that and getting my message out there. And, you know, it's nice because I'm not the center of attention now. And I have been in my career where I was this, I was for a long time. I, you know, I kept my 15 minutes of fame going for a pretty long time. And now if nobody knows me, I'm okay with that because now I can sit back and watch everybody else and study where I felt people had the upper hand studying me and seeing me do everything. Well, now I can watch everybody else and learn and grow and, 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 and have an upper hand in, in that sense, you know? So, um, I think all of that makes me tough and, and just facing life. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a very much a real person. Like I'm and anybody who knows me knows, I just say, I just say it. I'm like, you know, I tell the guys even in the gym, certain situations and I'm just like, yeah, but like if, you know, I didn't have a meal prep company help me. You know what I mean? You have to figure it out. I'm cooking now. Could I afford a meal prep company right now? Yeah, sure. I could, but you know, I like to rough it. I like to, you know, I don't like things to be easy. Sometimes I think there's certain things that you can make easier for yourself, but sometimes, and I think a lot of fighters can relate to that. You still want to grind, you know, Marvin Hagler said it. Um, I think it was Marvin Hagler that said, um, it's hard to get up at 5.00 AM when you're sleeping on silk sheets. So, you know, very I mean, true. It's, it is, you know, and I think that there's always going to be a struggle and it's funny, you know, my strength coach would always, you know, Phil would always say, uh, Phil Daru about having a chip on my shoulder. And I, I was like, I think we, I think that's good. I think chip on your shoulders can be good. You know, it keeps you honest and it keeps you hungry. You know, if, if you know, it forces you to want to prove, want to prove, want to push, because if you become too comfortable, then what is there, you know? So I find comfort in being uncomfortable and that's where life challenges us. And I, I'm always up for the challenge. What do you think was the toughest challenge that you've had to face so far in the last, you know, couple of years? Well, even even in your career, tell tell us a, a challenge and something tough that you can maybe inspire our audience. Tell them what you had to overcome to get here. Man, you know, there's unfortunately I hate to say it, there's been so many, but I got to say depression. I got to say depression for me, you know, uh, suffering with seasonal affective disorder and being in New York, a place that I loved and I was I was born and raised and having to feel, you know, anybody that understands depression and a lot of people don't, and they don't even know like what's wrong with me feeling stuck inside your mind. Like I, the way, the best way I can describe it is like, I felt like I was in a fishbowl and everybody else was living and I just couldn't, I could see everybody else living and I saw all beauty around me, but I couldn't be a part of it or I didn't, I wasn't deserving. You know, I could, I just, I just felt like, I just felt like just this darkness and I was like really alone, but everybody else was just out living. And I'm like, man, I, and it wasn't envy. I would just look at people and be like, man, I, I wonder what it feels like to, to feel like that, you know? And, and, and I recently went through a depression. My father passed away in April and um, I didn't know what was wrong and, and it's grieving. And, and the first time I've ever suffered grieving in this degree of losing my father, you know, and it, that was very difficult. And I feel like I'm just getting out of that depression too, you know? Um, but I've struggled with mental illness throughout my life. And um, I think that overcoming that and, and just showing up every day for myself, finding something and as much as I didn't want to do it. And that's the hardest part because you really feel like you're like bonded, you know, you're like stuck, like you can't go and you really have to like break that. And, you know, for me, it was my faith, my faith in God. And I just, Jeremiah 29, 11 was my life is my life verse. And, you know, God has a plan for my life. And I hung on to that. And I would pray and I just was like, I, this isn't what he wants for me, you know? And I knew this wasn't what my parents wanted for me or what I wanted for me, but I'm like, how do I, how do I get out of this? You know, um, 
trying, I, you know, was on medication, medication didn't work. I tried light therapy. I think one of the hardest, but easiest things I ever had to do was move and leave New York. And I left suddenly. It was very sudden. Um, I was training with Terrific Gist in, in, in Patterson, New Jersey, and I had just won the NABF title and I was running a, a gym and things like that. And life was good. I, you know, I had money and stuff, but I just was very, I wasn't well. And I just knew that I, if I stayed in New York, I, or I was staying in Jersey, I was right there at Cliffside Park. I, I wasn't going to survive. I knew I would die. Like, I, I don't know how to explain that. Like, would I have killed myself? Would I, I don't know, but I just knew that I would, I wouldn't, I wasn't going to live. And um, I had the opportunity to go to California. I used my savings account, all the money that I'd saved. Um, and I went to California, you know, thank God my aunt lives out there. Well, she did. She had an apartment in LA. So I stayed with her for like a little bit, but where I wanted to train was in um, Oxnard, Ventura area, which was about 53 miles North. So it was about an hour and a half, you know, with LA traffic, sometimes two hours. So I knew I had to find a place up there. And then, um, you know, just going up there and not know, knowing two people, literally, I knew a boxing coach and a nutritionist, but guess what? That's all I really needed to know because that's what I knew I needed to do to get myself back to where I knew I wanted to be. And, uh, I got off the medication and I just went and I just committed and I showed up every day and it was very hard. I had no, I didn't, I remember Haas, my coach at the time was like, you know, they were worried because I didn't really socialize with anybody, but I had a lot of shame. You know, I had a lot of shame within myself and talk, um, talk about that a little bit. You know, I mean, I was an NABF champion. I was, you know what I mean? Like I, I had, I had one, I had, was, I forgot I was, I forgot what my record was at the time. It was like 20 something. And I don't even remember. And, you know, I remember going into the gym and just not feeling worthy. You know, I just didn't feel worthy of, of anything because of, you know, overcoming the depression and just feeling very broken and like who I didn't even know who I was, you know, and I had been there before I've been in that place before because I was in an abusive relationship when I was younger and I didn't even know who I was. And I think there was a couple of times in my life that I lost myself. And I think a lot of people that happens to a lot of people, whether they want to admit it or not, they, they get lost. And sometimes subconsciously, they don't even know they're lost, you know, but then when they wake up, they're like, oh, wow, like, what the heck did I do? Like, you know, but I felt very lost and very, very shame and very um, embarrassed because I'm on Google images. You know what I mean? People saw things of me. Like, you know, I mean, it was just like, oh man. And, and I was more, I was more like just ashamed of myself, you know? And I knew I had, I, I realized now that I had nothing to be ashamed of. It was, it was not. depression and not. mental illness. And it wasn't something that I could control in the moment, but you know, I just always, I was always a fighter. And I just was like, you know, I just was angry. You know, I was angry at myself and it took me a long time to get through the you know, and even with boxing, I mean, even with what I'm going through now, I feel like I'm 150% deserving of, of, of a world title. But back then, I didn't think that. I didn't think I was deserving, not because of the the sport, but because of my own personal, you know, feelings towards myself, you know, being coming from that broken place. But I've, but you know what, facing that, overcoming that led me to where I am now. And now I'm sitting here like, man, you know, like, I'm not, I, I don't, and it's funny because they say that when you get older, you give you you give less of a shit. <laughs> and I really am at that point now where I don't care what people think. I'm like, I'll walk around. I don't care. You know, I still I tell people I'm ranked number one, whether I'm ranked number one or not. To me, I am ranked number one because they took that from me. So in you my head, you're damn right I'm ranked number one. And the minute they call me for that title, you better believe that I'm going to be ready. And I'm going to kick the shit out of whoever's in front of me because, damn it, I've overcome enough. I've been through enough. How much more do I got to prove? I don't got to prove nothing to nobody. I just got to go out there and just do get what, what I deserve. How, uh, you know, battling depression um, and you're talking about feeling shame, which you're, you're absolutely right. There was no mm -hmm. reason to be feel any shame. Um, you know, I think your career is a lesson in perseverance, right? Uh, two, you took two losses. Um, a lot of people would have packed it up after two losses. You haven't lost a fight now in, uh, you know, 13 years. And if you people want to bust chops about the pandemic, you know, you hadn't lost a fight in, uh, you know, 12 years. So, yeah. yeah. Um, what would you say to people that are at home that are dealing with depression or battling? Man, I got the secret. I got the secret to what's going to help, but you got to do it every day. You have to get up. I don't care if it's snowing out because I did it in the snow, in the freezing cold. I didn't give a crap. I got up every morning and I walked for 20 minutes. I, I swear that that will help. Just walk. Just get up and get out. Don't think. 
don't, because what happens in the mornings is, and this is what would happen to me. I would get up and my brain would take over. It's like, what happens? Your brain wakes up and it's like, oh, you're shit. Oh, life's horrible. Oh, you're not going to, you can't. No, no. You know, and I, before I even could think, I didn't even eat. I would just get up and get outside and go for a walk. And there were times where I was like, I would get up and the first thought I had was, I don't want to do it. But I didn't listen to this. I just went and I did it because I had to walk. I needed to get my endorphins going. I had to get my body moving. I was 180 pounds. You know, I, I mean, I, I, it was, I had gained a lot of weight. I mean, I was on antidepressants. I became a compulsive overeater. I would just sit home and eat. And, and that's why I see people that are very heavy and I don't look at them. I'm like, listen, I think most of the world has an eating disorder. You know, and I think it's triggered by emotion. And I think now more than ever, what happened during the pandemic? Everybody went into hibernation. They came out and they were all heavy. Very few people came out skinnier than they went in, you know? Me included, and by the way. Me included in that list. Yeah. So, you know, it's a, it's emotional eating. It's everybody, everybody said, but you're bored. You're sitting home. You know, but even during the pandemic, I mean, I know in the beginning, a lot of people were like, well, what the heck's going to happen? I thought like stuff was going to come down. From, I didn't even know. I was pumping gas. I mean, and I'm not one of those people now, but I was pumping gas with a damn rubber glove. I was like, well, whatever this thing is, I ain't getting it. And I would literally peel the rubber glove off. I was that. I mean, I wasn't wearing a mask in the car. I didn't do that, but I was definitely not touching. Cause I was like, I don't have hand sanitizer is not clean enough for me. You know? So I literally had the rubber gloves and then I got over that after like, I think like three, like I did it three times and I was like, all right, I'm good. I think, I think I'm being a little bit over, you know, but, um, but yeah, I think, I think that's the best thing is to get up and get moving. Um, and also for me, I, you know, I was an English major, so I would write, I would write what I felt. I, I and, it's, that. and it's funny. I have a lot of what I went through. I actually have it. I might, I, I might have it. I mean, I can actually, I might have it on my notes and I would, I would share it with you. It's, it's, I mean, it's crazy. I have the date. It was, uh, um, let me see if I have the feelings. Yep. Here it is. Uh, I think I, oh, is it February? Well, it, it, uh, where the heck is it? Oh, I don't know if I have the, I just felt like I wasn't worthy. I think I have it under emotions. I don't want to take up too much, too much of the time, but it was, uh, thoughts. Oh, here it was 20. Yeah. 11. Yeah. Here it is. This was in 2020. This February. Was, no, this was in February of 2011. Oh, when okay. I went through one of my worst depressions before I, this is when I moved to, when I was going to move, when I moved to California. Um, emotions were isolated, numb, disconnected. I'd sleep 10 hours and I was tired throughout the day. I had no energy, foggy thoughts, trouble focusing, concentrating, no excitement or motivation. I felt like I was on autopilot. I'd look at others and with, and wish I could enjoy my life. I felt lonely. I was scared, confusion, not thinking clear, hard to focus. I would eat to eat. I had weight gain. I felt swelling in my body. I felt like a dizzy, hungover, drunk feeling. I felt worthless ugly, not good enough, undeserving of any good happening in my life, death and dying. And I'm better off, but I know that's not true. So I had suicidal thoughts. So I would say like, I didn't want to kill myself, but I definitely didn't want to live. Um, there are times I get out of the house and feel disconnected, like not normal, or I stay home and sleep and I eat and I feel safer when I'm home, but I force myself to get out and fight this. Um, I feel emotions I know aren't real or really me. And I try to fight them and feel it is an ongoing battle. I feel any accomplishments wow. I have oh, made yeah. don't mean much like nothing is ever good enough. And I have more, but I'm going to leave that for my book. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable though. And thank you for sharing that. That's a, yeah. It's, I mean, they were, and I keep that because when I have hard days, nothing, nothing could compare to the darkest depression that I've ever been through where, you know, I, and people would look at me, you, just like when I said I was in an abusive relationship, you, I'm like, yeah, like it's easy to like you be know, anybody. Yeah, it it anybody. It's, it's not. It doesn't matter. You know, people, it doesn't. People, yeah, people don't know what other people are going through, and you're right. You know, you're on top of the world. You're, you know, like you said, you're using your 15 minutes of fame, and you're struggling, and you're struggling emotionally. But you, and I was going through that during Million Dollar Baby. I mean, people didn't know because my my depression started when I was a kid. You know when I couldn't get out of bed and my parents would, my mom recalled that during the winter months around September. So when school started kids, you know, I school first, it was great. Then slowly September, October, I started to like not want to get out of bed. And my, my parents thought like, Oh, she just doesn't want to go to school. It had nothing to do with that. It had to do with that. I, I, I chemically couldn't get out. You know, my, my brain wasn't allowing me to, to get up and go. So how'd you battle back? 
kind of like what well, what I said, just, um, well, not knowing what it was. And I mean, I think for the first part of my life, when I went through this, um, I just would go through it. Like it would just come and go and, you know, it would come and then it would go. And I just, the struggle I think was that I thought I was stupid. Like I didn't think I was smart because I couldn't focus in school and I felt very down. But then the summer came and I was like, oh, I am smart. Oh, I'm good. And then it was this throughout my life until I got older and it started to affect me, you know, cause now it's about, Oh, how do you look now? It's about your looks or it's about your, and I could feel like, and I want to be with my friends. So I was like more aware of, of, of what I was feeling. Cause when you're younger, your emotions, it's like you're a kid. You don't really know, you know? And I had a lot of anger. And I think that's where my anger stemmed from as a child was not understanding this, this. And then I would just lash out cause I was just angry. And, um, I was very violent as a kid. I'd slam my head against the wall. Um, I just had this anger and I, I just was so mad. And I know, I know there are kids that have done that. You know, sure. a lot of, there are more than I thought, you know, I never knew. And I talk about it. People are like, oh my God. I'm like, oh yeah, I started slamming my head against walls and then I would punch walls. And then I would, I was, I would self-inflict, you know, I would, I was, I wasn't a cutter, but I definitely would just like, just, you know, punch myself or it before boxing, you know, I mean, I had a problem, you know, and, and it was, it was serious. And I didn't know how to kind of keep it here, understand what I was feeling. Um, but battling that, I think it was, you know, as I got older, writing and being more aware of my feelings. But I think writing them down, kind of like I did. I mean, this is all from 2011. It's, you know, how many, 10 years ago, you know, that it's still, you know, it's still here. And, and I can look at it and I'm like, man, I can bring myself right back there. And I remember, but I, like I said, showing up and writing and getting up in the morning and going for walks and you know, accepting, asking for help. I think that was the hardest thing for me was to ask for help. That's and I think that's a big problem. Yeah. For a lot of people. Um, you know, I felt shame in asking for help, but I found that when I went online and I found self-help groups, like certified self-help groups, like yeah. I went to Al-Anon, I went to Overeaters Anonymous, you know, I would look for these, you know, like Al Alanon has a website, Overeater Overeaters Anonymous has a website where I could join these chat groups of people that were, you know, going through it until I felt okay enough to get out of the house and go to these meetings, um, which I, which I did, you know, I went to Alanon my first, my, you know, I have alcoholism in my family and I was affected by it. And I, my first meeting was when I was 21 years old. So anytime I would go into a depression, I'd go back to Alanon because I struggled with you know, dealing with the effects of alcoholism in my life. And, um, you know, and that affected me as a child. So it affected my emotions. And so I knew that I had to kind of sort out help in that area because it's, it's, it's a bunch of little things, you know, and then I knew I was compulsively eating. So I would go to these meetings and I remember like, you know, there were a lot of women that were, or men that were obese in there in the meetings and I'm walking in and I wasn't obese, you know, but I walk in, but I felt the same way about food that they did. It was my drug of choice. You know, and that's why I, tell, I understand addict behavior, you know, I mean, and I, you have to eat to live, you know, you could get rid, you can stay away from cocaine or remove it from your life somehow. You don't need it to live, you know, and, and that was, uh, that was a problem for me. Well, um, and for a boxer, you know, for, for me, obviously it, it's, it's hard, but it, you know, the effects it'll have on my life are health related. It's not going to mm -hmm. be career related in your line of work. Uh, you know, weight is just the weight is the, you know, basically uh, the stock and trade of the business. And, um, you know, you fight anywhere from what, 118 to 126. So what are you most comfortable at? Where do you, where do you like being at? 22. Yeah, 122. You know, I, but like, I never had to like make weight at 22. Like even now I'm walking around, like right now I'm like 130 and I just started training again. So it's not my weight. You know what I mean? Like, like I'm between 30 and 33. Like I'll go up and down there. Um, I was doing the bodybuilding. I was training for bodybuilding, you know, a couple months ago and I was eating like, geez, I was eating like 2,100 calories. And I was like, this is way too much food. I was like reverse <laughs> dieting. And I got up to 140, but the minute I, my body went right back down. Cause I, I think I saw 140 on the scale for like two days. And then I was back to 38 and I was like, oh, I got to keep eating because I got to get this. But it was, you know, it was like I, it was calculated. I was working with a, with a coach and, and she was giving me my macros and I was trying to fill my macros. So it wasn't like I was eating just crap to gain weight. You know what I mean? But I was still, you know, lifting weights and stuff. But she's like, no, we got to build. And it, it's long story short, I'm clearly not a bodybuilder. Not for me. <laughs> Very interesting experience. Um, 
got a whole new respect for food, totally understand. But I find that carbs aren't as great as you think they are because <laughs> I was so up to here with carbohydrates. I was like 200 and I think she had 210 grams of carbs. I was like, oh my God, I got to eat another piece of bread. You know, it was so funny. And, and I'm like, I can't. And then they're like, oh, eat a Rice Krispie treat. I'm like, I don't want to eat anything at this point, <laughs> you know, but I think it was good for me, you know, and, and, and my body and a lot of people would disagree, but I, you know, they're like, oh, you can't, I'm like, it's fine. I'm fine. You know, I, it was interesting. And I'm glad I did it. I was mad at boxing. I was super mad. I know you're mad at boxing. I was so, I was like, you know, screw this shit. You know, and I was like, I'm not doing this. I'm going to go be a bodybuilder. Like, I'm completely going in the other direction. And then I'm like, no, three months. I was like, no. I was like, no, I miss boxing. I need to use my whole body. I like to punch people in the face. Still. Yeah, tell, tell, tell us what boxing means to you. Oh, man. I mean, it's interesting. It's a love-hate thing, but I know. It is, but it's, it. you know, it's really been it's really been part of my growth as a human, like overall, you know, I mean, where I am now and how I use boxing. Now I have much healthier relationship with the sport now than I ever did in my entire life. Cause I remember you eat, sleep and shit boxing. And I was like, Oh, even when I was tired, I was getting up and no pain, no gain and all that crazy stuff. I'm like, yeah, that's great when you're young and you're like trying to like get yourself in through the sport now. No, now I, I, I absolutely love, what I do, I go into the gym, I get done what I need to get done. I don't need to test my toughness. I don't need to go in there and prove myself. I know I just sit back and I see some of these guys, they're killing themselves. And I'm like, I don't, I'm battle tested. You know what I mean? Like I, you know, they're still learning. And I, I know, I know I could push my threshold. I know, cause I will, cause I'm a fighter. You know, I know that in, in sparring today, even, you know, I was like, after the, we did five rounds and after in the going to the fourth round, I thought we were doing four. And then Derek said one more. And I said, okay. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to push myself. And that's, I think where I'm going to know, because if I didn't want to push myself or I wanted to quit, then guess what? I should absolutely not be fighting. But yeah, I was like, that's... I was excited. Yeah. I was and excited. You to get that you're ready. You're ready. Right. You're getting ready. You'll oh, be yeah, yeah. April comes. But I think, I think that's the thing though. Cause you know, when you're out of it and you're like, people say, I never considered retirement. I definitely was like, well, I'm not going to fight if I'm not going to get what I deserve. And, you know, now we have a plan and the plan is in motion and I have a big support system, you know, and, and I see how things are, you know, how things are kind of playing out. And, uh, you know, it's also a risk I have to take, you know, what am I going to do? I've taken, I've gone enough, but I just don't want the shoulda, woulda, couldas. And I didn't like how I was kind of like stepping away from the sport. Like I want to step away on my terms, you know, you know what I mean? Like I want to say, and plus it didn't help that, you know, COVID didn't help, you know, and that I haven't, that was probably the biggest thing. And, and it all makes sense. And then my father passing away, but you know what? I, it was a blessing in disguise because I got to focus more on my family than I had to my career, you know, and I got to focus on my job and get into a position now where I have a great job and I am able to work. I'm able to financially support myself hundred percent and fund my, I mean, not, I mean, fund my career to a degree of what I need where I'm not sitting here begging for sponsors. I know what that's like. I mean, could I use sponsorships? Of course. And will I have sponsorships? Of course I will, because I know people want to support me, but I don't mind. I've always invested in myself, you know, and I believe in me. And I think that, you know, somebody who's going to, I'm not going to sit back and I have my own place that I live. I I own my car. I'm, I'm a very confident, secure woman. And I'm the, probably the most confident, secure I've ever been. And I firmly believe that what you do in your personal life affects what you do in that ring. And I am just as secure and confident in that ring as I am outside of it. You know, I pay my bills. I don't need anybody. And I'm very, I, I love that. You know, I, I really don't. And I'm willing, I'm also willing to put that money back into myself because I know that I'm worth it. So I guess that, that tells you a lot of what boxing means to me. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, that's how much I believe in what I'm going to set out to do in it, you know, for, for now. And I have other, I have so many other options. You know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be, I own part of a tequila company. Um, I'm being approached by an online program called Live Trained. Um, with Mickey Ward. I was just with Mickey Ward and Jesse James Leha. We were just, you know, it's crazy. I don't know if you saw my post, but both of them saw me fight. Mickey Ward commentated my fight and Jesse James saw me fight at the Alamo yeah. Dome on the Holyfield in the card. And I got to watch both of them fight Arturo Gatti. I got yeah. to watch Mickey do it twice and Jesse do it once. And then I right. got to sit there and talk to them about it. And they remembered me. And I, well, I mean, Je- Mickey's known me for years because we did some work together in New York, but Jesse and I never met and we had an awesome conversation. And I think it was so cool to be able to connect with them. And there's so many fighters out there that I could connect with like that, you know, because I've been doing this since I was 17. 
That's awesome. Well, I think it's clear to say that you are uh, tougher than life. No question about that. Mm-hmm. All right. We have a part of the show that we like to do. Um, well, actually, you know what? I'm going to ask you real fast. Sum up super quick. Sum up, though, for anybody who's struggling. Uh, you know, you said go for a walk in the morning. Go get help you know, try to try to get some solidarity with uh, people online. Anything else you want to add to that? I think support I groups are great. I think reaching out and talking to somebody that you really trust and, and being vulnerable, don't be afraid to be vulnerable. You're already in a vulnerable place. Really find someone that you feel safe with. I think therapy is huge. I think having a connection with a higher power. I mean, God is my higher power, you know, relying on your faith. I think, um, you know, and if you don't know about God, you know, find out because, that's been a huge part of my survival is my faith and, and just being able to, you know, being able to get out of some really dark places, just knowing that I was worthy and that I was, I was created for a bigger purpose. Um, but I think the best thing is to get up and find, find a purpose, find a purpose every day. I mean, for me, when I moved, first moved to California, my purpose was to walk to Starbucks every day because my purpose was getting that damn cup of coffee. And <laughs> guess what? I could, I really couldn't, I couldn't not afford to do it. I was living on a very tight budget because I was living off my savings account. But I was like, darn it, if I have to go there and get a cup of coffee every morning, that's what I did. And that was part of my therapy. So I paid whatever. I mean, I got like a toll, a toll coffee, you know, black coffee with like Splenda or whatever. I got that every day because that was my purpose. You know, don't overreach. Just find little purposes. Make your bed every morning. Make sure. I mean, there was a point where I didn't want to brush my teeth, wash my face, take a shower, like nothing. Find order in your home and then get out but create those little practices, those little, little, um, accomplishments every day. It's like little fights, you know, cause the big fight is the big fight. The big fight is the depression, but the little fights that you win are going to lead and help you win that big fight. Awesome. Great, great advice from uh, the two time champ. All right. So we have something on the show. We call it the fast five. Okay. There are five random questions. You've got to give me a quick, quick answer, one word answer, or, you know, quick answer on everything. Right. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Favorite boxing movie? The Fighter. Ah, good one. Uh, is cereal soup no. and our no. hot dog sandwiches? No. Even though it's on bread and it's meat on bread? I don't no, care. I don't even eat hot dogs. It's, it's this disgusting. <laughs> Do you even know what a hot dog is? <laughs> yeah, so that exa- right. exactly. That's just like, it's like coagulated. <laughs> yeah, no. All right. Uh, if you could pick any superpower, which would it be? To be able to go back in time. Ah, good one. Uh, favorite sports team? Yankees. Nice. Good choice. Always. All right. Tell me tell me your favorite clean joke. Um, is Google a male or a female? Uh, female. Why? Oh, I'm just guessing. A female because it doesn't let you finish a sentence before making a suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm glad you said that. Not <laughs> no, right? I'm allowed, I'm allowed to make fun of myself. <laughs> Could it come from you? No. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to say a very special thanks to uh, my guest, two-time champ Maureen Shea. We're looking forward to seeing her back in the ring. Um, hey, can you tell us where we can find you on social media? Yeah, my Instagram is Maureen underscore Shea, M-A-U-R-E-E-N underscore S-H-E-A. Um, I'm on, uh, I, I mean, I'm not really on TikTok, but I guess I kind of am, Maureen underscore Shea. I, I throw up some boxing stuff. I really use it for the editing features, but um, you can find me on TikTok, find some of my boxing moves um twitter maureen shea and facebook maureen the real million dollar baby shea am i missing awesome. any, other, any other social handles no that's <laughs> Is that it okay because that's all i have i think awesome once again thanks again it was thanks great to have you it. always that's a pleasure so thank we'll you sp- speak soon that's going to be the final bell for today's podcast if you like what you hear give us a like and hit the subscribe button with your best power punch you can check us out at apple spotify stitcher and anywhere you can find quality podcasts We hope our stories inspire you to fight on. We thank you for listening, and remember, life's tough, boxes are tougher. Have a great week, everyone.